Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Caribbean Cultural Center, Caribbean Cultural Center in New York, and our program Curators in Conversation, a series dedicated to critical debate, dialogue, and engagement with curators who are committed to the Caribbean and its diaspora. I'm Grace Aniza Ali. I'm the curator at large at CADI, as we call it, and Assistant Professor of Art and Public Policy at NYU. First, as always, the way we start out our series is to thank our wonderful team at CADI for their hard work in putting together this program. Kat Lazo is our producer, working her magic both behind the scenes and behind the screen. Thank you, Kat. And a special thank you to the leadership at CADI, Melody Capote and Regina Baltron, who continue to support and invest in curators of color of, as part of CADI's larger mission as an institution working to advance cultural equity, racial and social justice. So, so far in our series, and we know we have a few fans who show up for every iteration of it, um, we've been honored to hear from curators working in the Bahamas, in Jamaica, in Barbados, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, among others. And so for this month's iteration of Curators in Conversation, we get to virtually travel a bit again, as we've all been doing this past year, to New Orleans, to Haiti, and to Guadeloupe. And so I'm thrilled to welcome into the digital screen and digital space, Nick Briere Aziz, who is an American Haitian artist and the community engagement curator for the New Orleans Museum of Art. And Joelle Furley, who is a Guadeloupean born artist and founder of Larta Carp, an international artist driven and artist managed space in Guadeloupe. Nick and Joelle, welcome. Hi. Hello. welcome. Hello, lovely to see you. Thank you both for your, your generous time tonight to share with us and exchange with each other about the dynamic work each of you are doing. So I wanted to pair these two lovely people together because first of all, you're artists first and you have a unique understanding and sensibility of the artist curator relationship. It's a lovely relationship. It can be a complex relationship, but you are often wearing those two hats simultaneously. And so I know that you would have a lot to engage with each other around that shared experience. Secondly, as our audience will see shortly as we get a little, a little bit of a, a taste of your practices, that you're both very community-centered, community-driven, and socially engaged in your work. And it really uh, warms my heart to see that commitment um, in each of your practices. And also, it's incredibly significant that you both have carved out, carved out roles as founders and leaders and managers of art initiatives invested in the Francophone Caribbean and its diaspora, and particularly for a conversation tonight in Haiti and for Haiti and Guadeloupe. So we're really thrilled to hear you expand on that um, institution building work as part of your practices, as I think what you've both been doing to move beyond the traditional white cube spaces and to work to create thriving alternative spaces and also ways of curating is really a beautiful model, even with its challenges, which I hope you'll, you'll share and be honest about, but it's a model that uh, we can all learn from and I know our audience watching will treat it as a model to, to learn from. So if our audience will indulge me just for a few more minutes, um, before I let you all share some slides of your work, if they will just let me do a little bragging on the work that you're doing. Um, for those of you watching more extended bios on Nick and Joelle is both on our website and they're also incredibly Googleable. So you can do an extended deeper dive on their work. As I shared earlier, Nick Briere Aziz, is an American Haitian interdisciplinary disciplinary artist and curator born and raised in New Orleans, which is where he's joining us from tonight. Um, in addition to serving as the community engagement curator, which is a title I wanna hear more about Nick. 
um, for the New Orleans Museum of Art. Nick is also the manager of the Haitian Cultural Legacy Collection, a collection of over 400 artworks started by his maternal grandfather in 1944. And I got a little peek at some of Nick's slides. And so I know we'll be hearing a little bit more about that story. Nick, as an Andy Warhol fellow myself, I was so happy to see that you're a recent welcome to the fellowship. So Nick is a, an Andy Warhol Foundation Curatorial Fellow, where he'll be examining the migration of Black Haitians and their influence on the art and culture of the places they have set up homes and roots in. Nick, that's a wonderful project. I'll be keeping eyes on it and welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Joelle Furley is joining us from Guadeloupe. So we've got New Orleans in Guadeloupe um, mm -hmm. welcomed in the room. Thank you, Joelle, Thank you for being much. here and, and for, for joining us. Joelle's art practice spans photography, video, performance, writing, and storytelling. She is the founder of Larto Carp, an international artist-driven space in Guadeloupe. And the space is named after the breadfruit tree that hovers above it. And Joel, I have to share with you, I really love that detail. I, it warms my heart and I love the intention in the naming of the space. And it's such a powerful symbol. I hope we'll get to hear a little bit more about that later yeah. too. Okay. Today, the organization has become a leading artistic space and has worked, for example, to see Guadalupean artists represented for the first time in the World Festival of Black Arts in Dakar, the Havana Biennial in Cuba, just to name a few of, of the wonderful groundbreaking work that Latter Carp is doing. And more recently, Joel established a cure, A C U R E or alternative curating, which seeks to acknowledge, quote, non-commercial, collective, performative, as well as in situ art practices as part of the heritage of Afro-descendant art producers. As we all know, there remains a great disparity in which Caribbean artistic communities are more visible and more supported than others. And so it's a gift to have you with us, Joelle, and to hear about your wonderful and impactful work in Guadeloupe. So thank you for being here. Thanks ever so much. So just a quick um, note for our audience on how we usually run our program. We'll start with a brief uh, opening talk and some slides from Nick and Joelle to just give us a sense of their work and their practice. And then Nick and Joelle will delve into a conversation with each other on some of their shared concerns and the intersections in their work and whatever else they'd like to talk about. Um, and if you're watching us on YouTube and Facebook, please do share your comments and your questions in the comment section or the chat section. And we will be bringing those to Nick and Joelle in the Q&A portion of our program um, in a few minutes. So Nick, the screen is yours. We'll start with you. Uh, so thank you all once again for the opportunity. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and start with slide one. Um, so for me, um, my practice, particularly my relationship to um, Haiti um, and, and the work that I'm doing now starts with, with these two people. Um, these are my grandparents. And this was actually a photo that was taken um, on uh, when when my grandfather returned uh, to Haiti with my grandmother um, in 1956, and this was I think at a at a kind of party ceremony where um, my grandfather was you know introducing her to to these people um, he had now become you know in community with uh, for at that point I believe six years. Um, so my grandfather, uh, born and raised in Haiti moved, uh, went to medical school in Montreal in 1944, and then uh, moved to the United States, where he ended up settling in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is uh, five hours north of New Orleans. And there he uh, was a doctor for more than 60 years um, and really established himself as a leader in that community, whether it was in delivering um, black babies or being a civil rights leader. 
And so this um, image to me represents that, that union, that love, that strength. Um, but also while he was in Montreal in 1944, he started this Haitian art collection, just simply saying, I wanna stay connected to Haiti. I wanna stay connected to my heritage in this foreign land. Um, and when he met my grandmother in 1956, they continued to collect art, which then, you know, years later is now a collection of over 400 pieces of artwork. And so that is really the root of my practice. Um, growing up around this collection, learning about um, Haiti through the, the eyes of this collection um, and really becoming um, just, just having that pride to really exist in a sea like New Orleans um, with this all around me. So um, next slide. Um, so this is an example of um, an installation that I've done with the collection. Um, so this was um, a, an exhibition series I, I entitled Beauté Blié, which is uh, translates to Forgotten Beauty in Creole. Um, and for me, it was the idea of thinking about the forgotten beauty that exists within all of our individual familial histories um, that we sometimes forget. Um, and just the, also the forgotten beauty between the connection between New Orleans and Haiti, which I'll you know, explain more in a second. So this, um, this image is one of the rooms. Um, and with this installation, I just included different things like family photos. Um, I had letters that my grandfather had written to my grandmother um, when they met each other um, in the courting phase, um, when my grandmother went back to Haiti to have my mother. Um, and so this was just kind of like, what I looked at like as, as a family room. And then next slide. Um, and then this image uh, was the second room, um, which just had more works from the collection and also invited viewers to really learn more about the Haitian New Orleans connection, which is um, being discussed more here, but it's still at this point is still severely under discussed. And so this installation ran for um, two years. It was, a, it was a rotating exhibition series um, at Preservation Hall. And Preservation Hall is one of our most notable jazz venues here. And to me, I also thought it was significant to really bring art into a space um, which is so um, known for music and really kind of also showing those connections between the music um, and, and the music and the histories of places like New Orleans and Haiti. So next slide. Um, so these next two images are really just to touch on very quickly that the Haitian New Orleans connection. So um, this first image is uh, an image of Haiti um, and you can obviously see the architecture. Um, next slide. Um, this is an image of New Orleans. And so obviously there's some, some stark architectural similarities here, um, which I think a lot of my work tries to explore those, those, those connections, whether it is architectural, cultural, food, music, history, um, next slide. Um, and then going to the music aspect of it. So this uh, in Haiti is known as a rara. Um, it's just a street procession of uh, music, um, horns, uh, individuals just in the street dancing. Um, and then next slide. And this in New Orleans is called a second line. And so obviously you can see again, those similarities between two, two places um, that are, that are so deeply connected. Um, and for me, as, as someone who was born in New Orleans to a Haitian mother um, and a father who was born here, you know, that connection goes even deeper in so many ways. So a lot of my practice really is, is kind of going back and forth between these two things. Um, the next slide. Um, so this uh, is an example of an exhibition that I curated um, at the New Orleans Museum of Art in my role. Um, I was a co-curator of this exhibition. It was entitled Bon Dieu uh, Between and Beyond. And it was looking at, again, that, that connection between New Orleans and Haiti. And so for those who are unaware, um, following the Haitian Revolution in 1809, um, nearly 10,000 um, Haitians migrated to the city, which at that time doubled the, the size uh, population-wise of New Orleans. And with that migration of people, um, we then had traditions such as second lining, which you saw in the previous slide, um, shot, the shotgun house style, Creole cottages, um, many of the food traditions that we share here today, a lot of that came with that migration. And so this exhibition was an example of that and me just sharing that with different uh, members and partners within our communities. Um, next slide. Um, this is just an example. So uh, this was 
a community festival in which I went to the festival and did a similar exercise to where I showed pictures of New Orleans and Haiti and then prompted uh, students or individuals, whoever walked up to, to really choose which is which. And almost every time, you know, there was, there was trouble. And so when there would be trouble, we would sit and say, or I would ask, you know, what, why are you having so why do you think you're having so much trouble? Um, and then we would kind of open that up into a conversation of, of why there were so many similarities, what Haitians brought to the city, the, the connections between Haiti and New Orleans and even other parts of the diaspora that in New Orleans, we, we just, you know, we were a part of, but we're not necessarily always certain of, of the roots of. The, the, the actual roots of any of our traditions are unfortunately at this point aren't as promoted. Um, so these types of engagements outside the museum's walls were examples of doing that. Um, next slide. Um, so just to end, I just wanted to go over just my own personal art making practice. Um, so this is a still uh, from a video piece that I made um, entitled Pimpin' Ain't Easy. Um, and this piece uh, was looking at exploring the um, relationship between museum acquisition practices, uh, looting, some looting as a, as a in some ways a foundational practice of museum acquisitions. Um, and so it just was really a mashup of clips that were illustrating that point, um, but also to uh, overlaying Biggie Smalls' Give Me the Loot song um, and just really kind of showing that that blend between um, history, pop culture, um, obviously Basquiat, um, and really just trying to illustrate how that foundation dictates how art from Black artists is appreciated today. So for in the example of Basquiat, his piece can sell at an auction for $150 million, and yet his family, his descendants do not get the benefits of any of that as, as the industry is currently structured. And so, um, again, going back to the idea of how museums acquired black art at one point of looting these African objects without any type of compensation, without any type of, and to, to this day, I mean, obviously now there are movements that are going towards changing that, but I think there's a relationship there that also needs to be explored about the foundation versus how now black art can continue to be acquired and, and, and valued, yet a lot of times the artists and their descendants aren't reaping as many benefits as the collector or the institution. Um, next slide. Um, so this piece is a piece that I did in 2017. Um, I'm particularly very fascinated with the history of, of New Orleans and the place that I that existed in and was born in. And so this piece was called New Wars, New Stories, New Heroes. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, four different Confederate monuments were taken down in 2017 here in New Orleans. Um, this particular Confederate monument uh, was that of General PGT Beauregard, and this monument actually existed in front of City Park, where no, where New Orleans Museum of Art exists. Um, that land is also a former plantation, and so I, I've always been fascinated with the fact that for a hundred years, this this statue went up in 1915. For a hundred years, a statue of a Confederate general existed outside of a museum, which has been exclusionary in its history, which is on the land of a former plantation. Um, so this piece uh, was really one that I collaborated on uh, with an artist named T-Rock Moore in 2017, and just really um, interrogating that, that history, that history of this land that we all exist upon in this city. Um, and the next slide. Uh, finally, this is, this is a recent piece of mine um, uh, entitled When the Slaves Go Marching In. Um, and this history is uh, another deep history here in New Orleans. In 1811, um, Charles Deslons, who was believed to be from Haiti, um, led what was what would become the largest rebellion of enslaved people in North American history. And so that happened just along the river parishes here, not too far from, from where I'm sitting today. Um, and this is another piece of New Orleans history that is severely underdiscussed. And to me, it also has a correlation to just athletes and, and how, um, you know, the correlation between how athletes are continued to, their, their bodies, their bodies are used um, for capital gain um, in the structure of, of sport. Um, and also the fleur-de-lis, the fleur-de-lis being a symbol that has existed and continues to exist so prominently in our city, but also a symbol that has a controversial history. At one point it was used to brand runaway slaves. And so thinking about all these um, 
you know, relationships between these symbols, these histories and these narratives of a place like New Orleans and also Haiti. You know, it's believed, as, as I said, that Charles Islands came to New Orleans from the island of Saint-Domingue. And so um, really looking at, um, I, I've, I've come to believe that, you know, my practice is a, is a real assemblage of, of history and pop culture. And, you know, based on pop culture's definition, at one time, slavery was pop culture. And so I really believe that just blending these, these narratives allows us to really understand more about um, our place, um, our institutions, our symbols that we see around our city. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me and my practice. Joelle, we will hear from you now. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. And thanks to Caddy for inviting me on your platform, which I really discovered just now. And apology to Nick. Um, I hope you hear me fantastically. <laughs> apology to Nick, because I, I didn't know your work, and uh, that's a fantastic opportunity to discover it. So um, prior to my presentation, I just, I just want to um, uh, recall that the, the slides I'm going to, to show are obviously copyrighted from some of the artists from L'Autocar, but also from outside L'Autocar. And therefore, I didn't have the time to put their name in. And I really want to apologize for that, as I shall just cite their names. And obviously, I will present L'Autocar in, um, in a much deeper uh, aspect, but uh, running through to our new theoretical uh, laboratory program, which is A.Cure. Um, which uh, um, I hope you will uh, get a better glance uh, uh, later on. And um, to start with, if, we, if I can have the first slides, Kat, thank you. Um, I will, uh, let's run on to the, the third slide, actually, because uh, the title now you, you have it. Uh, Lautica being, as uh, Grace said, uh, um, a space um, that uh, I set up to to, to, this, to build uh, this platform uh, in my own home. And that's the, the beauty of it, the originality of it. And just to give you a little bit of the context of the Caribbean, you have here the map, which hopefully will uh, allow you to, to locate us, because I'm not too sure about uh, your knowledge about this French enclave, which is um, um, there to speak about a double type of uh, confinement, so to speak, which is on one side, we, uh, um, we have the confinement of the language, we speak French, and also uh, the uh, isolation geographically, since we are under French government governance, and we our currency is the euro. So the, the island is very small, and we keep uh, going back and forth um, with Ma the sister island called, uh, which is Martinique Island. So my speak is about, if I can go to the next slide, um, is also uh, about to recall the setup, the political setup of the island, which has uh, very much to do with um, a constant resistance to the French uh, system, to the French uh, uh, governance. And the latest uh, huge one was that in 2009, uh, with the big strike taking place for over 40 days and uh, with the spokesperson de Motar seen here who um, was very much uh, um, uh, instrumental to, to setting up this strike. Um, Guadeloupe was therefore uh, on the, on, put on the big international map of the world and uh, we decided uh, in 2019 to celebrate our 10th anniversary at L'Autocar, invited uh, this spokesperson as well as uh, academic to discuss the, the, the artist uh, input during that strike. If you can go to the next slide, uh, I will just run through two, two other examples uh, of uh, conferences that we did. Um, to demonstrate that we are very trying, we're very trying to to uh, link to the political setting of uh, the discourse with uh, Guy Lafarge, a playwright who's, who who set up this uh, play on a true uh, elements of historical element of a uh, court case that took place 
back in uh, 1968 in Paris and um, following a big strike again to, taking place in, back in 1967 in Guadeloupe. And that was the platform for uh, very famous lawyers at the time, very young lawyers, uh, Guadeloupean lawyers to uh, start a, an open debate with the French state on the situation of Guadeloupe. And if you can go to the next slide, I will show you a much uh, recent artwork from Anno, a Guadeloupean artist living in Canada, uh, whose um, uh, very piece that I show here, which I selected purposely to present my own, um, uh, is taking us to what I would consider to be a new era on how we deal with slavery and this history and how we want it to be uh, a new form of representation for us. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that uh, I develop uh, um, a, a short line within a tale that I, I uh, took the time to write uh, for three months back in uh, a residency in Japan. And uh, that was a way for me to uh, work on my biggest ever piece so far, which is on the next slide, uh, taking as canvas the entire island of archipelago of Guadeloupe. So where you see the red dots are the places where I put a, a sound uh, device, uh, pressing the button of, of this device, as you can see on the bottom left, would be um, the way to have a, a, a tail take, uh, taking a, uh, taking you to a, a kind of imaginary uh, story. So now coming up to Lauter Cap, if you can go to the next slide, you will see the space, the building. Lauter Cap, um, uh, from now on, Kate, if you want to just run through the slides, and I'm going to just uh, present it. So Lauter Cap is this space which uh, I decided to, to buy when I, I was still in London uh, uh, as a student, actually. And I, um, I, um, I was uh, formatted into the, the format of a uh, uh, wide cube type of uh, space, I must admit. And to be honest with you, our first uh, members and uh, even exhibition were very much um, westernized uh, type of uh, forms. And we started off uh, doing a replica, so to speak, of what I, I was seeing in London and Paris in the galleries and museum. And little by little, we obviously extending our, our reflection through um, practicing uh, practices such as uh, residency um, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that we could re-question and rethink the way uh, we actually present artwork, first of all, and the way we engage into the theoretical discourse within it. So I, um, I, um, I had the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, um, making, you know, uh, in a way managing for 40 uh, exhibitions and 40, over 40 residencies uh, through our platform, which has uh, uh, over 75 members at, at one time. And we, that took us to over 22 territories back and forth because we tried to go on residency and come back from residency. So uh, here for the figures, but the, the beauty of it is that within uh, um, the, the, the group, some of us managed to meet and work together, create uh, groups or duo and have shows together. And today the situation is that members are more or less uh, all, um, running their own uh, uh, platform, so to speak. So you will see some slides here to give you an idea of uh, uh, the very space, uh, which is very uh, short and very small. It's a three-story building, but in fact, it's a convertible one. We keep uh, um, um, having uh, one minute a workshop, another minute uh, an exhibition, another minute a studio. Uh, we no longer do the, the, the conferences anymore. Uh, within the space because it's far too small and we do um, uh, any, anything on everything with our partners, organizations. So um, carry on then, okay, and get on, on the sliding of the show so that uh, everybody gets a, a better understanding of what we've been doing. 
Um, so here are some examples of our exhibitions, uh, like this one of David Gums and other people who came in residence. I must say that residency uh, have been run onto the, the, the idea of not imposing on the artist to finish the, the, the residency with an exhibition. Uh, quite the contrary, we wanted to make sure that it was an experimental space and that they could, whenever they wanted, uh, uh, link with the, 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 the public but not uh, be uh, forced to, to um, show uh, um, everything in a kind of a museum of gallery uh, style. So we had workshops a lot and we still can continue to have some now uh, during the, the crisis, uh, the pandemic crisis. And obviously what is kind of new now is that we are reaching out to um, another uh, uh, type of public audience that uh, came to us and uh, in a in the form of um, youngsters uh, who are actually part of a football ball club and who we've been running uh, workshops since uh, uh, the last uh, June uh, on a weekly basis. So we're qu quite happy to to see uh, how things are developing for us because it almost gives us. Okay, we have lost uh, Joelle just temporarily. We'll try to um, get her back. Nick, while we wait uh, for Joelle to get her connection back, hopefully we we hope she can, as, as our audience uh, knows, she is um, joining us from Guadeloupe. So all things can happen both here and everywhere else in terms of these internet connections. Um, and Nick, I was really struck by the photograph you showed of you working with the youth in New Orleans. And um, I know just reading a little bit about your work and your practice, having that constant engagement and collaboration with young people in New Orleans has meant a lot to you. Um, and so I wonder if you can, in this sort of liminal space we're in while we wait for Joelle to get back, um, I just find that really important. Um, and I wish you, it would, would love for you to talk more about uh, the work that you're doing with young people in New Orleans, both to, um, to expand their sense of what art is and, and who art is accessible to and who art spaces are accessible to. As you know, the Caribbean Cultural Center is located in Harlem and we hear so many of our Harlem young people tell us they don't feel you know, the, the museum institutions within New York City are for them, are meant for them. And so they're not, they're not going there. And I know that's work that you have, that's really close to your heart. Yeah, no, um, I, it's, it's been close to my heart, I think ever since I came back to New Orleans, which was in 2013. Um, and I, you know, had gone to college, um, traveled extensively across the world. I, I went to grad, graduate school in the United Kingdom and you know, came back to New Orleans and, and in some way just re-understood how amazing and global our city is. And so I think for me, the work that I do with youth is um, really focused on showing just how amazing the city is, but like you're saying, also showing how, how artistic, like how, how art here, it, it happens everywhere. Like there's, there's art um, when you're walking through the French Quarter, there's art when you're walking past someone's porch and um, they're, playing a trumpet, you know, like there's, there's, there's art in the second lining, you know, that there's, there's art that exists in so many ways. And I think really showing the bridge between these institutions that have excluded, you know, people who look like us in the city, you know, and then showing how th those, those worlds can collide um, is, is I think part of the work um, that I do and, and part of the work that I try to share. Thank you, Nick and Joelle, you're back. We were just keeping the audience uh, happy while we wait for your connection to come back. So go right ahead. Thank you, Nick. 
Are you muted, Joel? No, we can't. Um, she'll go back and, and um, come back in. So let me try another uh, question, Nick. Um, I love that you started out your slides with the, the portrait of your grandfather and um, grandmother. And you started from a place of love and you also shared that his work, your grandfather's collecting was the catalyst and the inspiration for your own practice. And so I really love that, that beginning story that your practice, your collecting practice, your institution building practice your curatorial practice comes from really a place of love. Yeah, um, and I think a, a, a place of um, preservation of that love. Like I think my grandfather you know, started collecting art because he was in this place, Montreal, where he was one of one essentially. And you know, he wanted to, in, in, 19, in the 1940s, you know, and so he wanted to really remain connected to his home. Um, and, and remain connected to that love of, of his home. And so that obviously expanded, you know, in meeting my grandmother and then they continued to collect art and she was extremely integral in really taking the collection to where it is now because uh, my grandfather was an OBGYN. He was often delivering babies. I believe he was the first black doctor actually in, in the community of Shreveport. And so, um, you know, if you were born during a certain time and you were black in Shreveport, my grandfather, most likely delivered you. And I learned that throughout my life um, when I was living there. And, you know, just that idea of really preserving um, a culture and history in, in a community, in a country that has promoted such a different image of, of that place. Haiti, Haiti is often, I think in this country, we often see the, the negatives of Haiti, all the, all, the, all the issues that Haiti had. I mean, across the Caribbean really, but obviously I'm speaking from the Haitian perspective, but, um, I think you know the, the collection was a, was a, a, a interrogation against that as well, and so I think for me, um, really recognizing the, the privilege that I had um, in growing up to really just be surrounded by this collection, be surrounded by Haitian artists, I mean, just really soak that subconscious influence in um, to really you know obviously become an adult and realize you know how much of of those those roots, how much how, how much of those seeds have grown. Into, into my interest in the work that I'm doing. And so I think, you know, the, the additional layer to that is in a place like New Orleans, which does not honor its um, Haitian influence as much or its African influences as much as it does its um, French or Spanish influences, really using the collection as a tool to um, really show that and show that in a way that is engaging, you know, showing in a way that is showing people in New Orleans um, images and, and portraits and, and decadent paintings of themselves in a lot of ways. Like being able to see black people in paintings that that can be in or outside of the traditional museum space. Um, mm -hmm. That's a big, big part of it for me. And so Nick, forgive me, you know, because of this technology, we're all in each, Joel, can you hear us? I'm trying to get her back. Uh, we, I, Nick, can you hear? Uh, I, I can hear you. I can't hear Joel. Joel, we're missing your audio. Um, so we have to still keep working on it. Oh boy, this is... This Technology. is this, this I know, but you know, for our folks that are in the Caribbean, it's, 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 it's really, it's sad for me to see that these are, we, we had a little bit of, of this uh, last time when we were speaking with the curator in the Bahamas mm -hmm. too. Um, so I was I was saying that because of the technology, we're all in each other's houses now. We can see each other's houses. So is that some of the collection on your uh, wall? That, that is, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with it and, and any uh, updates? So yes, yeah, so that piece right behind me um, is actually uh, an artist named Edgar uh, Briere, um, of no relation, I believe. Oh, so, well, how serendipitous though that he, yeah, yeah, um, and Edgar, um, I believe actually works mostly in metal um, work and we have a large number of his paintings in the, in the collection. Um, I believe my grandfather had a relationship with him. 
um, you know, was working with him to do uh, different exhibitions, I think at one point. And yeah, we have, we have a, a nice number of the collection uh, of his works in the collection. Um, and yeah, and I think in, in these, in these several paintings that I have um, in my, in my apartment with him, um, water is a, is a prominent theme um, for him. So he's, he has this piece, um, which is the, to my left, which is, um, he is showing Urzuli, um, the Loire Urzuli, um, and she's just surrounded by fruits and tropical and lush. And um, there's another piece where he has two, uh, a union of, of a man, a woman happening kind of um, it underwater. Um, so I, I know that water is, uh, water and, and, and uh, Vodou is, is a prominent theme in his work. Mm -hmm. um, Nick, I, I wanted to ask both you and Joelle this, and when we get Joelle, which I'm saying a prayer for when we get Joelle back, um, or, hi. No, we cannot. Uh, Joelle, try restarting your computer entirely. Kat, if that's okay with you, um, if that you think that's a good idea, and then maybe we can try just a, a hard refresh. Um, as I said in the introductions, Nick, you and Joelle both, uh, first of all, I, it's hard to find somebody these days in our 21st century world, particularly within you know, our field, that just has the privilege to wear one hat. I think we all have a million and one hats, but you have two specific ones where you're both artist and curator and, you know, artist with a, with a very particular vision for your practice and curator with a very particular vision for your practice. Uh, and I'm implicating myself in this as someone with multiple hats because I struggle with it daily. How do you find both the balance that, you know, between these two uh, roles and also the boundaries um, between these two roles? And if you can also speak to the artist curator relationship as well, um, how you negotiate those relationships when you're both artist and, and curator. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think that's, there's, there's so much to that question. Um, it makes me think of um, there's a, there's an amazing artist um, from here, um, deceased now, but his name was uh, John Scott, and uh, John Scott uh, he has this quote that says, um, "I cannot call myself an artist until the community calls me an artist." Mm -hmm. And I think it's I remember I found it um, I was at an exhibition of another artist who included the the quote I think in his uh, abstract or text, and I remember just seeing it and reading it and just being so struck because um, it's it's so profound. I think the idea of the artist truly being um, someone who's 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 making work to serve, serve the community to 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 express the the needs, to express the thoughts, the feelings of a community is something I think I've I've done, you know, before I even recognized its relationship to like my current work in practice. And so I think, you know, in thinking about for me, um, how that relates to the curator artist relationship. You know, my role at NOMA is so centered around um, creating community projects. And so I think showing the, the, that relationship between the two to me is in some ways it, it, it makes it easier. Right? When I think of um, rooting the idea of community in both, you know, in both hats, with both hats, you know, like not, not, ne not necessarily separating the two. You know, they're obviously different. Um, you know, parts of, of the of the work and, and the logistics and the production sides of, of both are completely different at times. But I think if you're centering community in those, um, the, the lines are, are, are closer together. Thank you, Nick. And do we have Joelle? Joelle, can can we hear you? Yes. Let's try. <laughs> Hello. I'm so sorry about this. I don't know what happened. No, it's, it's the state of our world. Uh, we were keeping keeping the folks company for you, Joel. So feel free to jump right yeah, in. Yeah, if we could jump to number uh, slide seven. Uh, yeah, you were here. Thanks, Penske. So I would just say very briefly, I'll try to really wrap up to uh, on this um, uh, uh, 
building presentation, we, we started a, a new direction to become more independent. So we run uh, events such as, if you can uh, just flip through cats so that you know, we won't waste time, uh, such as running our own cafe and, and make sure that we, we could do branches. And all our members are now very um, big on, on the art scene, international art, art scene. Him, for example, he's now about to show work with uh, um, Anish Kapoor. Uh, here, uh, uh, um, uh, Henri uh, Tonio was actually on the left side, you have Lato Cap um, uh, project that he presented uh, uh, as um, to the uh, Havana Biennale. Uh, as a solo show to represent Guadeloupe, if you can go to the next slide. And um, David Gums, who's very big now in uh, on um, China, making uh, video mapping absolutely everywhere in the world. If you can go to the next slide. Um, the couple, uh, Henri Tolio and Annabelle Guerra, who set up their own performative uh, platform and festival in Martinique, if you can go to the next slide. And um, unfortunately now she, she passed away, but uh, uh, Belkin uh, Ramirez from the uh, Dominican Republic uh, and ended up doing her residency in our space to uh, work for her exhibition in Santo Domingo. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so the, the part I wanted to focus on is more the theoretical and research part. Uh, you can feel through. So I, I started as a big statement that uh, somehow out of the art history, um, you know, the, the work from uh, 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 artists, if you can just stay there, Kat, sorry, uh, from uh, um, African background is totally ignored. So I started with a statement that we also invented modern and contemporary art. And another aspect of uh, uh, my speech has been to take a recent uh, uh, element in Martinique with this statue here of the Empress of uh, uh, Napoleon uh, uh, White. Uh, who's um, known in Martinique to be beheaded. Uh, the decapitation uh, kept coming up back and forth all the way back in the time of Aimé Césaire, the big intellectual figure, um, who decided not to put, him, to put the head back because, because each time uh, the head would be all the time being thrown away again. So if you can go to the next. Um, uh, here you've got the work of Jean-François Bouclet, one of our previous members, who's now big on, on the art scene, and this very artwork of his, um, who's uh, been part of the collection of Saatchi and Saatchi. You can go to the next one. And uh, obviously we presented many conferences here at Memorial Act, the museum uh, dedicated to the memory of slavery here in, in Guadalupe, uh, that opened up only uh, back uh, five years ago. You can go to the next one. And we, we have uh, among members artists who do their own curatorial uh, practices and we always obviously there to assist them with the catalog, the, um, working on the text, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, here for the foundation foundation, uh, Clement Foundation in, in Martinique. We can go to the next one. And this is what I really wanted to focus on, uh, the Cure project, uh, which is uh, uh, revisiting our practicing uh, from our region to make sure that we can converse both with curators who hope, oh, often happen to be um, actually French curators coming from the mainland, France, and not really afraid of what's going on uh, from uh, the Caribbean point of view. If you can go to the next slide, so if you can just run them over. So we started off a solo exhibition with a, an architect revisiting the imaginary space and other um, um, younger artists who got residency in Paris. And this artist, uh, Christian Sabas, who deal with uh, mental illness and uh, the way you know he wants to uh, use art as a space for expressing uh, that uh, in that uh, form of being illness, and we um, started also investigating into uh, on the ground the practices of the street. So part of it is obviously what's happening on the walls, such as uh, the, the, the artwork you see now. And uh, if you can go to the next, and we see the carnival, the procession, very much so in the line of what uh, curators Claire Tancon, who had, a, I suppose you may know of Nick, because she was at, at some time uh, based in uh, New Orleans, and she did this fantastic exhibition on uh, mass. 
And uh, I just want to touch upon uh, other artists who are uh, working a lot with masks, like this composer, uh, Christophe Chassol, if you can go to the next. Uh, other artists as well, Hervé Bruce in Martinique as a mask man, if I go, we can go to the next one. And um, uh, obviously the, the large scale um, practices from here, uh, Grossol, if we can go to the next one, he was actually at, at the Venice Biennale at the very edition of uh, um, uh, uh, Oakley and Weasel. And this is my work here uh, back in Haiti, back in the 2011 after the earthquake, where I, I was doing this performance for 24 hours, not uh, stepping down, not eating, not drinking. And uh, that was the starting point of me reflecting on performance as a very uh, use of the body in a sort of positive way and a, a kind of a resisting way. And I want to touch on now to two uh, elements which I introduced, that of the statue in Martinique which were destroyed, if we want to go to the next one. And, and that has created a lot of uh, uh, debate here uh, in Guadeloupe and Martinique because the abolitionist uh, uh, portrayed on the on the bust Victor Schelcher um, uh, suddenly became uh, the big symbol of for the young people who decided to destroy uh, the, the statue to remove it from the pedestal and uh, as you probably know from then. Uh, uh, on a global scale, in Liverpool, in London, many uh, countries had uh, the similar event of youngsters taking down um, statues. And my um, my input in that was to uh, write uh, the element of uh, giving the voice for the, those young people who, in a way, I I see them as curators. Um, if you can come back to the uh, to the uh, former one, here is the last. Um, event which took place not even a few weeks ago. Uh, I took part with Lauta Carp and a big team of 11 people in uh, um, uh, applying for a, a big art call uh, put up by the French state in a, um, a, a big memorial in the in 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 memory of slave uh, people. And uh, the, the whole idea was to reuse the names that were given uh, uh, on, the, on the eve of the abolition uh, back in the 19th century. And I took on um, uh, to have a big debate internally with my team to uh, suddenly um, decide that uh, that was not a good idea to, um, um, to celebrate those names because they were names produced by the French uh, colonial administration and not at all the original African names given to those people. So I, I really made a stand which was uh, later discussed internally at the level of the French Minister of Culture. And uh, if you can go to the next, I, I will show you how I, my project was to display those names. It was actually to do a, 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 a verbal sound performance over the sculpture here of this tree, uh, sitting right in the middle of uh, the Paris uh, garden. And uh, those, um, this performance was uh, in, uh, an, envisaged to be on a national scale whereby all the school children would have um, um, go and research for an African name and be able to um, um, display it over uh, as a soundtrack over the artwork. So I think it's pretty much over. If uh, uh, I can just announce that uh, uh, Guadeloupe is now going for uh, the first ever Biennale, which will be taking place later this year. And the artist we've chosen is the one, if you can just go back to the previous slide, is uh, the one being uh, here, who's a very um, high now on the, on the, on the art scene, uh, especially uh, uh, in France, uh, Minya Biaviani, and she will be uh, uh, having a, sh a solo show um, during that, that moment. So I'm so sorry about all this uh, um, technical issue here, but um, you know, I want to take uh, you, I want to take to give you back the, the mic, uh, Grace, and uh, uh, so that we can engage with uh, Nick. Uh, oh. But congratulations on the biennial, Joel. That is wonderful and extraordinary news. So happy to see that. The, the, the head of the biennial should be uh, curator uh, Simon Jamy, who's been very big on the scene of African remits and quite a few other things such as Bobinois. Uh, he's been announced 
not even a month ago. And uh, obviously, we are, we, are, we are very pleased to see that somehow the, the work we've been doing internally will hopefully have help in the, uh, you know, taking, taking the, the, the politicians aware of the, our need as well to maybe set up our own uh, space to, to have our contemporary art practices here. Wonderful. Nick and Joelle, the floor is yours. I'll quietly slip out and be back in a few. Okay. Um, I mean, I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by a lot, um, but particularly the relationship of the French and African influences in Guadeloupe. Um, and so I think I'm particularly struck by that as living in a city like New Orleans, where we do also have such a strong influence from both sides. Um, I'm just curious if you could talk more about just that and, and how that exists within um, art spaces, but also just, I think, I'm curious as well, just like communities, like maybe even those who may not engage with art as much, like how, what that relationship looks like. This, you mean the space and the community coming to the space? Um, or well, just the relationship between um, maybe those who don't engage with art as much in regards to this, the French and African influences um, in, Guadal uh, in Guadeloupe. I hope I, I understand you. I'm talking about Africa, actually, uh, just to jump on the, something else I wanted to discuss, is that um, we have now the pandemic and the, the island is actually stuck. We are not able to receive, not uh, not go abroad. So we had a complete program which was meant to be our African season. And uh, the whole idea was to have five artists from different countries of Africa coming into our space in residence. Uh, unfortunately, th this should have started in, in January. Unfortunately, we are not uh, given the permission to have those artists and we, you know, we've been asked to postpone first the, 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 their coming and um, unfortunately it looks like uh, we will have to really uh, find another way to do it. So in a way, I really want to, to take on your platform here, Grace, because I think it's just happened to arrive at a very good timing whereby we, we can uh, uh, get the influence to carry on the work online and uh, be able to get closer into uh, deba debating uh, more profoundly on that. Um, to better answer your question, Nick, I think uh, what I can say about our relationship to um, the, the community and, uh, and, and the rest of the world, such as uh, Africa, we, we, did, we did have to engage with uh, uh, big platforms like uh, uh, in Dakar, not the, just the BNR, but also in 2010, we were five artists going there to uh, uh, as part of the big event that was, uh, um, I can't remember the name now, um, oh God, that just came out of my, my mind, but they invited uh, 3,000 artists uh, as the the festival, the festival of um, of um, it was the third edi edition of the festival of uh, uh, African descent, and uh, that was um, a good opportunity for us to put across uh, our work as a small organization, and uh, to link with other artists that we already constantly meet on a, the international scene, and um, obviously, as you probably know. When it comes to uh, post-colonial studies, uh, the French are not very fed with that. So uh, somehow L'Artecap was the platform where we started to introduce the cultural studies and all the reference, references that come with it because I personally spent 15 years in the UK and I was obviously uh, a very uh, and keen on, on linking on, on to these discourses. I went to conferences held by no less than Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy, and I worked with Ineva and Autograph, all those platforms that were already uh, very much advanced. And when I say very much, it's like 30 years advanced on the, the cultural studies compared with France and obviously with Guadeloupe. So the discourse here in Guadeloupe is actually uh, very much removed from uh, getting closer to the African heritage that only been made possible uh, on a huge scale with the latest museum that came out in 2015, which is Memorial Act. 
The whole purpose of this institution is now to uh, focus on, um, on the researching, on the, the promoting of all this part of history that the French somehow uh, have been putting aside very much so. Uh, up to now, in a way, L'Antica was uh, the space where we will reflect on this uh, uh, cultural element and we will try to uh, engage with how to revisit representations uh, in the art form, but also in a way uh, art critics have been um, presenting artworks because, as I said so far, what happened mainly was that uh, um, we were somehow um, visible on the French national scene but through to art critics and art curators who are French, not at all Caribbean. So the discourse would be different. And somehow Latoka came into the landscape to uh, put a stop on such practice, to redefine um, the way we should uh, present ourselves. And that has been in a way very successful because the, the, the artists become uh, artists through curators, through uh, managers of, of uh, uh, organizations such as L'Artica, and that really empowered many of us to um, set up what I would consider to be the premises of a new era for um, producing our own uh, legitima legitimization uh, uh, within the discourse, so to speak. Mm. And have you noticed in the in the ten years, if I'm correct, that Larto Cap has has been an organization? Um, have you noticed a shift in just the the numbers or the the prominence of of artists, you know, coming from like that kind of like that, like you mentioned, like that next generation, that that new shift? Um, have you noticed any major stories from from that that have stuck out? Oh, most definitely. As I said in the end of my presentation, uh, I think the, the, the reality of uh, having a Biennale coming up soon with a top branch curator is enough to demonstrate that suddenly, um, you know, Guadeloupe was, has been put on the map of uh, the mainstream contemporary art scene. And uh, to me, um, you know, I, I really want to believe that uh, our role has been uh, kind of a uh, uh, important in, into this decision. To give you an idea, uh, the regional council decided to send uh, to the, the Venice Biennale, but the Hof scene, uh, three artists uh, back in uh, 2019. The three artists who represented Guadeloupe under the, the, the umbrella of a Guadeloupean pavilion. And uh, that is just to say um, that suddenly the politic, uh, the cultural policies uh, started to, to get interested into contemporary art. And that's really came about because we worked a lot um, in, into making sure that they could be uh, more open about it and more um, sensitive to uh, responding to this kind of platform that so far were, were not very much um, uh, um, open to us. To give you an example, I mean, the, the art in Guadeloupe is, very, is heavily subsidized by the French uh, uh, state. So it, to, to be able to travel, as you know, is very expensive. When we decide to go to Cuba or Venice or any other trip that we've done recently to freeze art fair and uh, to 154 in London, uh, we have to really uh, count on our own, you know, prayers to do so. So that has enabled us to, to get fed, first of all, uh, um, critically, and to in turn be able to feed in uh, our cultural uh, um, um, uh, politicians uh, and our counterparts, our colleagues, to make sure that uh, we keep um, in the line of what's going on um, outside Latica, because we work inter internationally. We, that's really the, the we, we, we are very pleased to, to, to describe ourselves as the center of what uh, can be possible 
And we, we have this little short line that said that we do art from Le Moule, which is the very city where L'Artocarp is bay, uh, to uh, the rest of the world, from Le Moule to the Le Monde. Hmm. That's beautiful. I, I've noticed that you've touched on, uh, into your presentation on uh, two things that were very uh, uh, interesting for us. When you mentioned the industry, with the Basquiat figure. And as you probably know, uh, Caribbean is actually very much in the loop of what's going on on, on the international scene. Uh, we've seen many initiatives come into our island of uh, wanting to have the artists part of a market, uh, wanting to have a gallery setting up and, and obviously so-called helping half artists to, to get by financially. So that's something that has been um, uh, constantly our, uh, uh, you know, main concern, so to speak, because we don't want to end up uh, having artists producing artwork just for a market, knowing that we fully understand that the way artists operate um, on the on the on the ground is that they want to refuse actually this mainstream contemporary art scene with. Uh, which is for them a kind of a way to enter the liberal uh, system and uh, which is something that keep trying to resist. So um, it is interesting to note that uh, the art form which are extremely uh, uh, valuable here are usually collective art forms uh, non, um, with no um, financial interest. You mentioned Bastia in a way that uh, his work is still being sold, but the family uh, doesn't get anything out of it. So we are fully aware of that. And also, although the French system allows the law, allows um, people who uh, legally to get, you know, revenue generating from the resale of artworks now, uh, it is yet a big concern because as soon as you step into the market, you know that uh, you, in a way, lose your own soul. And that's something that is um, uh, in dis discussion throughout our, our way of doing artwork. That's why in this space, we're very proud to, to have it because it's a totally independent space. We obviously try to raise money to get funds from a, a small charity organization, foundations, but we, uh, and obviously we do get, uh, sub, uh, we, we are sometimes getting uh, some um, uh, uh, subsidies from the state, but it's always purposely done. It's when we want to invite an artist or a curator uh, to come to our space for a few months or, or so. And um, apart from that, we really try to run with our means. So at, we currently, for example, we've lost our website and that is something that is for us a, a, a new way to ask for people uh, to, to take part financially, to, to be able to, to get a new website back. But over the last 12 years that we've been running, um, our concern has been to really try to find alternative ways of um, presenting artworks, which are somehow viewed from the, the, the mainstream um, uh, uh, international scene without getting us into becoming part of the very huge art market. Not that we refuse it entirely, obviously all the members would be more than happy to suddenly be paid to have an exhibition uh, internationally and most of them do actually today. Mm. Um, I myself, when I am invited uh, elsewhere, you know, I do get paid for it. So I, I would not reject that. But um, what I mean by that is that we also want to carry on the work on opening up the consciousness, especially from a French point of view on how to deal with the, the critiques of uh, the reception of our practice. And that sometimes means, you know, taking um, us to avenues where we don't want to compromise onto what the, the artwork is about and sometimes touching on sensi sensitive uh, uh, themes such as slavery and uh, we don't want to, to, to be told, you know, uh, like the, the last uh, slide I showed, uh, what we should be doing. Because, for example, the, 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 the slide over the, the names of, uh, of slaves to be 
uh, put on a pedestal as a monumental memorial thing, you know, for us it was very important to teach the French state uh, how ridiculous uh, it was to engage into uh, such um, uh, um, um, initiative because it would almost claim that uh, this is where our history started mm. as French citizen, you know. But we want to claim back the fact that we are coming from Africa and before uh, slavery, you know, we do have still a lineage, although it is unknown and we want to honor that lineage. Yeah, no, I, I think I was particularly struck by particularly thinking about um, the echo. Um, Obviously, here in, in New Orleans, being at one point in history, um, one of the capitals of the slave trade in, in North America. And so this is my first time thinking about how just those names, in some ways, I, I see it as, as, an, as an honoring because I think there are so many instances here where that history is so buried and we do not get to discuss it or illuminate it um, in the ways that we'd like to. Um, and I think just the sharing of the name or sharing of the narrative from that particular, whether it's a plantation or that that rebellion, um, just opens the discussion up. Because I think in, in, in our instances, there's so many times where the discussion hasn't even been started. And um, I, I think it, I, I see it as like an entry point. Um, but the idea, I think, of those names, like you're saying, being rooted in colonialism is, is, is something that is, is, is so true and real. Um, and it's really, I think the, the, the sharing of the name, from my perspective, I think is, is getting us closer back to that uh, reclaiming or that, 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 that connection back to the, the source. Um, I think it's a first step. So I'm, I'm particularly um, yeah, struck by that. So you'd be actually surprised to hear, uh, because actually the debate is still going on, by the way. I forgot mm. to say that um, we, with my team of 11 experts, we applied for this uh, um, uh, uh, um, memorial, mm. but uh, we didn't make it to the first day. We were first shortlisted and then rejected, and uh, we still to hear about the finalists. And uh, that would be quite interesting to know what's happening, but in the press, and I'm talking about not just a few days ago, uh, already a big debate ended up uh, emerging in the press because uh, what happened with my application, and I'm sure a few other artists also did uh, point it out to the French government, but hey, come on, you want to celebrate those names, but they are not ours, you know, somehow you imposed them those name on our, on our family. Hmm. Uh, we, we, those, the debate is still going on because actually what happened and we're mentioning about the archival work that you did with your, with your relatives, which is fantastic. Somehow it was also an, an organization, a small charity who decided to get, dig out all the names uh, trying to find precisely where they were coming from, on which plantation they were belonging to, etc., which is a remarkable work. But, however, um, nonetheless, some of the names, for, for example, were a total insult towards our family. I can give you uh, just one example. Uh, one of uh, the, the, the family would be named, uh, you know, Big Tit or clitoris or sese or titi or nigger, you know? Mm. So this is what I put in my application. I, I did actually point it out that there were no use to celebrate such insulting names for some of the families because that, that it was obvious that uh, uh, somehow the abolitionists were playing with all those mass of people that they have to quickly name for administration purposes. And somehow the organization who did all this work of ar archiving, digging out those, those names, they were, they're still sticking to those names. They actually want them to be published and displayed because for them it's 
the work of a, at least a good 10, if not 15, 20 years or so. But I did say, as an archival point of view, it is very important to have those names. And those names make sense here in Guadeloupe. For example, a city in Abim decided to display the very name of all the plantation that were on Harris uh, um, town and somehow as a memorial, which makes sense here in Guadeloupe, but it would not make sense in the context of Paris, mm. in a garden where people would just come by, pass by, you know, and just read names that to them, you know, it's nothing but names, basically. Yeah. So this is where we were touching very much upon. And, I've, uh, and uh, to me, this is precisely what curate, uh, alternative curating is all about. Because curators deal with space, we have to also question what space we are dealing with. Is that the white Q space that I uh, decided to first come back into, uh, you know, almost transplanting the model that I have seen in um, London? Or is that actually the street? Or is that actually the mental space that we need to also reshift and rework on? And not just for us, but for those people we're talking through to, we're talking to who sometimes have very preconceived ideas of what is good to do and what is not good to do. And here clearly, the memorial was not um, debating um, uh, uh, in full because after we've been rejected, I received actually two, <laughs> two uh, uh, fantastic uh, um, uh, notes, feedback from uh, top ranch cultural officers who told me, well, look, actually we want to say to you that your application has been given us a lot of debate and we actually sel first selected it but then it's been rejected because you decided to shift onto these African names and we were not sure whether this would be part of the, um, the setup, the setting of the, the call. So that's where, to me, it's a very narrow uh, uh, move, but, you know, slightly, little by little, we're moving on to the uh, uh, milestone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really, uh, one route that I see at, at on both ends of this equation is just this idea of preservation. And I think, you know, there's one side that is obviously preserving these names and these histories. I, I think both, both sides are ach achieving the same thing just from different angles of it. Um, like I think about here in New Orleans, how so much of our French and Spanish history has been preserved, whether it's the the portraits or the furniture or um, the architecture, you know, just different elements of just that French, Spanish and European perspective, that colonial perspective that have been preserved so well. And yet on the opposite side, I think our African narratives and histories haven't been. And I think for African Americans, you know, those who are really looking for that deeper connection to the diaspora, the deeper connection to Africa, we're, we're, we're looking for those those avenues wherever we can get them. Um, and I, well, I was just gonna say, I think for me, it was just growing up around that, I think really, you know, having, you know, grandparents who really prioritized that that idea of preservation of, of culture and, and their histories. Um, I just recognize like the, the influences that that has had on um, the way that I am working now and just the way that I think prioritizing African Americans collecting and preserving our narratives, you know, supporting our artists, you know, buying our artwork um, so that we don't have to maybe, you know, rely on that validation from that larger institution or that larger um, gallery. You know, the, the support can come from within truly, um, but I think it takes um, a shifting of, of how we uh, appreciate and value um, different things. Yeah, I think we, we, we need to be careful not to be nostalgic about some of the aspects of the art, um, uh, of the historical uh, element of uh, dealing, in dealing with slavery times. Because sometimes, due to the lack of a, a reference, we tend to uh, drip 
have a grip on something that is literally just a piece of material, you know, mm -hmm. that has no relevance other than the one that uh, enables obviously to retrace the gene, the, 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 the family tree and, and uh, which is obviously something very important, but you know, we, we need to transcend all this. And this is where uh, my work, I mean, if I am to be called a curator, then I will probably uh, just say that I try to cure, <laughs> so to speak, uh, those who are curators, but uh, sometimes are not very much affected about what's going on in, uh, in, in uh, the, 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 the debate for us uh, today. And I really want to make them aware of uh, uh, the move that we are all meant to be making today. Joelle and Nick, thank you so much. And I wanted to come back in um, just to get a few more questions coming in before we have to say goodnight in about uh, 10 minutes. And Nick, this is a question about audience. And you have to, both in the site that you're located and the physical city that you're located and the multiple institutions that you are working through and working with. There's a lot of uh, shifting going on within your, your curatorial practice and the community work that you're doing. And so this question is about your perspective, your curatorial perspective on audiences. And um, often time I do, I, I think in our field, we truly have to do a better job about getting to know our audiences, you know, what they care about, why they're there, why they show up in our space, who is absent, who is not there that ought to be. And largely, I think in our field, we're, we're so wedded to the numbers. Well, X number of people came to the biennial. So that says what? What does that mean? That we have the quantity, but do we know anything about these folks that show up to be in our audience? And so I'm wondering from a curator, from with your curator's hat on, how are you thinking through audiences, the importance of, audi of knowing these audiences, especially as you're sort of shifting between these very different organizations? No, oh, I think that's, that's a tough one because I think working, um, as I mentioned at a, at a museums across the country, are obviously having to explore that question right now. And so working at a museum, um, in a city like New Orleans, which is majority black, um, but at a, in, in a museum and institution which has excluded black people for a period of time in its history, for, for decades of its history. And then trying to reshift that is, um, that's, that's tough, that's complex. That's, um, that's something that there can never be enough energy towards trying to, to reshift that. Um, and I think from a territorial perspective, I think about it in New Orleans, kind of going back to that idea of the majority of the city being black and the majority of our cultural traditions, whether it is second lining, whether it is um, food culture, whether it is music, jazz, jazz music, New Orleans being the genesis of jazz. So much of our cultural traditions are rooted in the African diaspora, rooted in black people. And so thinking about in terms of audience, how if, if the goal is to transition how different audiences engage with these institutions, how we can shift the idea that this, what is, what is considered for this institution, what is considered art in, within this institution and what is considered um, from, from the audience perspective, the comfort level, the, like the, the belief, like you said in Harlem, the idea that a museum or institution isn't for you. No, it is for you because as you're, the, the, the culture starts with you. You know, the, the culture has started with these communities these institutions were created to create a, a box to try and dictate what is shown, what isn't shown, who can access it, who can't. The culture actually starts outside of the building and it's truly on the building now to rethink about how it engages and, and what it shows and, and what it considers art versus whatever else. You know, I think when thinking about audience, that's, that's, that's what comes to mind for me. Mm -hmm. And Joelle, uh, we, I want to circle back to this beautiful um, commentary you both were having about naming. And if you can share with our audience um, your thinking behind naming um, your organization, um, 
and, and honoring the, the symbolic importance of breadfruit and what that means both within a Guadalupe context, but it has a very powerful symbolic meaning. And I, I really do feel that naming is very intentional for you. Yes. Also, I really want to, to touch on the fact uh, coming back, I mean, setting up Lauti Cup in 2009, so over two years ago now, um, was uh, a huge uh, debate, internal debate, on as to how to promote it. I didn't want to go on to the discourse of uh, saying it is a Guadeloupean platform. I didn't want to go through the discourse that it was a Caribbean platform, nor a black art platform. I just wanted to make sure that it was uh, the, again, to transcend the whole idea, the concept, to make sure that it could speak internationally. Now, having said that, <laughs> it has to be said that Lautocap is actually a word that is unknown in Guadeloupe because I reverted back to the scientific name of the plant, which is uh, from the Latin word Artocarpus. And obviously, researching on that. Uh, was a way for me to make uh, us aware that it started with A-R-T, art, and uh, quite frankly, it is very hard to pronounce even for the French themselves, the Guadeloupean people. So L'Autocarp, people will say, well, even when you type it on, you will go to L'Autocarp and nothing but, but L'Autocarp, was actually for me a way to import a, a word that is very well known in Reunion Island, for example, but not in Guadeloupe. And I took the, 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 the signpost of next to the building of this tree, which is the breadfruit tree, um, as a reference because the tree was imported, as you probably know, uh, onto this region, the New World, uh, from Tahiti, and because it was a quick way to feed slaves at a very uh, small cost. And I decided that Nauta Club would be this very space who, where artists could develop artwork but also feed the rest of the population, um, you know, spiritually, uh, and mentally, and obviously through art practices. Wonderful. I love that. I, I really love hearing that story of, of naming, and it's such a beautiful um, and far reaching story. And we're almost about out of time, but Nick, I have a quick question for you outside of yourself, of course. Um, what do you think or, or who do you see in terms of the, the curatorial field pushing, pushing forward contemporary Haitian art, reimagining, rethinking what that means, what contemporary Haitian art means? If there's someone or a movement that you're impressed with, um, that you you can share? Uh, yeah, um, I think there are several people that come to mind, um, artists and, and curators themselves. Um, Edouard Duval Carrier, obviously. Um, I think, you know, following his work just as a, as, you know, as, as a Haitian, just as, as consistently, constantly um, inspirational. Um, Rosie Gordon Wallace, uh, who, who um, has the organization Diaspora Vibes in, mm -hmm. in Miami. Um, and just like that, that idea of uh, bringing together artists from, you know, multiple different parts of, of the Caribbean, the diaspora in the United States. Um, those those two stick out for me as, as people that I look to for inspiration. Um, and just, I think just friends, you know, artists, artists, Haitian artists who I, who I meet um, and, and learn more about. Um, Manuel Matthew uh, is, is an artist, uh, I believe he's based in uh, Toronto, is, is one that I've uh, learned about within the last two years. Um, I believe he has an exhibition um, in Toronto this, this year, I believe so exhibition in Toronto this year. Uh, and yeah, just I think friendships like that, artists, you know, hate other Haitian artists who, who share with me different, different artists to, uh, to look at. So I'm appreciative of, of all of them. And, and, and those types of um, sharing. And Joel, if I could just add on what Nick has just been said, uh, I would recommend all the work of you mentioned Edouard Duval Carrier, who's 
we've been working with, but also the work of uh, Giscard Bouchard in Haiti. Mm. And we had in residency here two artists from Haiti many years ago. Uh, one of them, Sébastien Jean, who just passed away, who was becoming very big on the, on the art scene. And, uh, you know, I just want to, to uh, send a little uh, uh, thought for, for him and his family. You answered my exact question, Joel. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the end of our program again, Joel. I'm so happy you 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 forged through the technical difficulties and were able to still get back to us. Thank you so much, and I'm I'm truly sorry. I know how frustrating that can be, but thank you for not giving up <laughs> with your connection. to me. And Nick, thank you for helping us keep the audience occupied um, while we um, waited for Joelle to come back. But to, to just hear both the individual stories of what you all are doing for Guadalupe, for the Haitian diaspora, and then to see the intersections within your work, although quite briefly, because there's so much that we could go into tonight was really meaningful and I just want to thank you both so much. You're now forever part of the CADI curatorial family. We'll be doing more programs and no more projects so we hope we can call on you and invite you um, for more things. Um, and thank you again so much for being here as always. Kat, thank you for holding us down on the tech side. And everyone, good night, be safe, and we will see you soon.